Every day, millions of people drive past road barriers without a second thought. You'll find them on ramps, medians, and along cliffs, just waiting to protect you during a crash. But what if I told you these barriers don't just protect you, they're the best safety feature on roads? Statistically, modern barriers have helped cut road fatalities by over 80%. That's not an accident, that's engineering. But here's the strange part. Many of these barriers are built with rigid materials like concrete and steel. And yet, instead of stopping a car cold, they safely redirect them and keep passengers safe. So how is that possible? And what makes modern barriers so uniquely effective? To answer that, we need to look at where it all started. Following World War II, the US launched the largest highway expansion in history. The goal was simple, connect the country and move goods faster than ever before. But there was a problem. A critical safety feature still lagged behind, road barriers. Early barriers were basic. They were built to mark hazards and slow down wagons. But as high-speed cars took the road, a major flaw became clear. Instead of preventing injuries, early barriers made crashes worse. Vehicles would launch over them, flip violently, and even be pierced by them. What should have been a safety feature was actually part of the danger. The turning point came on California's Highway 99. In the span of just five years, over 700 people were killed or injured in preventable head-on collisions. That level of failure pushed engineers to rethink everything, from materials to how a barrier should respond in a crash. And over time, they didn't just improve the concept, they perfected it. Now road barriers don't just stop cars, they protect the passengers inside, allowing them to walk away from a once deadly crash. But this raises a question, how exactly do barriers keep passengers safe? To answer that, we'll start with the most popular type, concrete barrier. Concrete barriers are everywhere, bridges, tunnels, and tight medians. From the beginning, these barriers were built to be rigid, and that hasn't changed. But what has changed is how they manage the forces of a crash. Early concrete barriers were tall and vertical. They could stop a car, but they did so brutally. When a car slammed into one, it stopped almost instantly, causing the force of the crash to shoot through the frame and into the passengers. So, engineers came up with a simple yet genius solution, the New Jersey Barrier. This uses a sloped profile that gently lifts the vehicle upon impact, guiding it back toward the road instead of stopping it cold. That redirection also helps reduce rollovers and lowers the risk of severe whiplash. But that same slope creates a new issue, especially for smaller cars. Some climb too far up the face of the barrier, increasing the chance of tipping. To fix that, engineers also use the F-shaped barrier. It works on the same principle but shifts the brake point lower, keeping lighter vehicles more stable during a crash. While the jersey and F-shaped barriers are the most common, they aren't the only ones. There are several variations of concrete barriers, each tuned for different speeds and environments. But the core idea stays the same. When space is tight, the best option is a barrier that doesn't move. However, this rigid design comes with a major trade-off. Since these barriers require stable, even ground to work properly, they're difficult to install on uneven terrain. So when conditions aren't ideal, engineers turn to a more adaptable solution, cable barriers. They look simple, just a few steel cables stretched across a media. But that simplicity hides one of the most effective barrier systems on the road. And getting there took time. Early versions used low-tension cables that sagged and struggled to hold up during a crash. When a car veered off course, some barriers let it pass through, putting everyone on the road at risk. So engineers made changes. They tightened the tension and mounted the cables on collapsible posts. Now, when a vehicle hits, the posts yield and the cables flex, spreading crash forces across time and distance. But that motion doesn't just slow the car down, it lowers the force felt by the passengers, lowering risk of injury. Still, not everyone's convinced they're safe. Some argue that cable barriers aren't chosen for performance, but for price. And at a glance, it's easy to see why. Cable systems cost far less than other barrier types, several times cheaper than concrete and about 40% less than guardrails. To some, that simplicity looks like a shortcut. But the numbers tell a different story. Two major studies, covering more than 10,000 crashes, compared cable barriers with concrete and other barriers across a range of conditions. And the findings were consistent. Fatality rates were nearly identical, sometimes slightly better with cable. And more notably, cable barriers showed a clear advantage in reducing injuries. So while they may look simple and come at a lower price, cable barriers have earned their place on modern highways. But there's a catch. 
Their flexibility only works if there's room for it. Cable barriers are ideal for wide medians, but not so good when space is limited. So engineers needed something different, something that doesn't require as much space and isn't as rigid as concrete. That's where guardrails come in. The modern guardrail is the result of decades of redesign. It doesn't just stop a crash, it controls it. But its first versions didn't do either. Early guardrails were stiff and unforgiving. When a vehicle hit one, it could tear straight through. So engineers changed their approach. And in 2017, that approach was put to the test. During a rally race in the Canary Islands, driver Tomas Kasperchik lost control on a cliffside turn. His car skidded sideways and slammed into the guardrail, just feet from a 200-foot drop. But instead of tearing apart, the system responded exactly how engineers planned. The rail flexed, the posts rotated and transferred the energy down into the soil. Everything worked as one collective system, helping both Kasperchik and his co-driver walk away from a once deadly crash. But while modern guardrails manage side impacts well, their ends weren't always so safe. In the past, instead of absorbing energy, these terminals acted like metal spears, slicing straight through the cabin, leaving no chance of survival. To fix that, engineers made a genius redesign. Instead of being rigid, modern end terminals are designed to collapse in sequence. When a car hits the end, the impact head slides along the rail and bends it in a controlled fold, helping dissipate energy that, in the past, would have gone straight into the cabin. But while this design is safer than its predecessor, it introduced a new risk. You see, as the rail bends, it can curl back towards the car, posing another danger to occupants. So some systems take a different approach. Instead of crumpling, the terminal pulls the rail through the impact head and channels it safely under the vehicle. This genius motion reduces the forces on the cabin and keeps the damage where it belongs, in the barrier, not the people inside. Most manufacturers saw this kind of protection as the gold standard, but one company quietly made a change to save money, and everyday people paid the price. In 2005, Trinity Industries made a quiet change to their ET Plus N terminal, one of the most widely used in the country. They narrowed a key part of the design from 5 inches to 4. It was a cost-cutting move. Internally, they projected the change would save millions over time, but they didn't report it or retest it. They just put it into production, but that missing inch changed everything. You see, the ET Plus is designed to collapse in a crash. But with the now narrower channel, that mechanism jams, turning the modern, safe terminal back to dangerous spears. For years, the cause went undetected. Many passed it off as a fluke. But it wasn't until a whistleblower named Joshua Harmon filed a federal lawsuit. He uncovered internal emails showing Trinity executives discussing how to implement the change with no announcement. And in 2014, a jury found the company guilty of defrauding the government. They were fined $175 million, tripled under federal law to over half a billion dollars. But the real fallout wasn't in the courtroom. Multiple states banned the ET Plus from new installations. And Trinity, once a trusted name in roadside safety, was now the face of corporate betrayal. But not every failure happens behind closed doors. Some play out on live television in front of millions. And when they do, the whole world pays attention. About his father, he's looking up. For the care center, Dale Jr., the care center's this way. In the early 2000s, NASCAR had a growing safety problem. The concrete barriers lining their tracks could stop a car, but they couldn't soften the impact. That flaw stayed in the background, until 2001, when everything changed. On the final lap of the Daytona 500, Dale Earnhardt struck a barrier head-on. From a distance, the crash didn't look dramatic. It looked survivable, but it wasn't. Earnhardt was rushed to the hospital, where he was pronounced dead shortly after, with the cause being a skull fracture from the impact forces. This crash rocked the NASCAR community and exposed a long-standing flaw in their crash barrier systems. Now NASCAR didn't just want to protect its reputation, it wanted to protect its drivers. So they turned to researchers from the University of Nebraska and the Indy Racing League with one goal in mind, build a barrier that doesn't just stop a crash, but keeps drivers safe. That led to the creation of the Safer Barrier, steel and foam energy reduction. Engineers added two key components in front of the present concrete wall, steel tubing and foam blocks. On impact, the tubing flexes and the foam compresses, allowing the force to spread into the blocks, ultimately reducing the forces felt by the driver. And it worked. 
Crash after crash, drivers walked away from impacts that once would have been fatal. And by 2005, every major NASCAR track had adopted the new SAFER system. But those barriers were built for a specific car on a specific track. Highways are a different story, and they're now being hit by something no one planned for. For decades, crash barriers were designed with one thing in mind, an average car, around 3,000 to 5,000 pounds. And for a long time, that worked. But vehicles didn't stay the same. They got bigger and heavier. And recently, they got something else, batteries. Electric vehicles don't just add weight, they change where the weight goes. Instead of sitting high up, like in an SUV, most of the mass is packed low, right at bumper level. That's exactly where guardrails are designed to absorb force. But now, they're taking on twice as much force. In crash tests, the results have been brutal. One EV pickup punched straight through a standard guardrail like it wasn't even there. So now, engineers are rethinking the barriers themselves. They're exploring stronger materials, like thicker, high-grade steel and reinforced polymers, designed to absorb the heavier, lower hits that EVs deliver. Because these crashes aren't edge cases anymore. They're becoming the new normal. And the barriers that once protected us now need to be rebuilt for what's next. But not all barriers are built for everyday crashes. Some are designed to stop the unthinkable. Eight suspects connected to the 2016 terror attack in the southern city of Nice are due to go... At airports and government buildings, the threat isn't just a fender bender, it's a vehicle being used as a weapon. To stop that kind of attack, engineers use high security barriers built to absorb massive force in the shortest distance possible. Bollards are one of the most common. They look simple, just short metal posts lining a sidewalk or entryway, but underneath, they're anchored deep into reinforced concrete. Some are rated to stop a 15,000 pound truck going 50 miles per hour in under three feet. Other systems go even further. Crash gates and wedge barriers block vehicle access points entirely. Crash gates look like oversized swing arms, but are built with reinforced steel frames that can halt large vehicles on impact. Wedge barriers, on the other hand, rise from the ground at an angle, like a metal ramp suddenly appearing in front of a moving truck. They deploy in seconds, often triggered by security systems or guards, and when locked in place, they're nearly immovable. These barriers aren't there to manage crashes, they're built to stop them cold. These serve as a reminder, when the risk changes, the design has to change with it. And that's exactly what's happening now, because as vehicles evolve, engineers are thinking beyond steel and concrete, looking at what the next generation of barriers might look like. And in some cases, they don't look like barriers at all. One design uses spinning drums mounted along a rail. When a vehicle hits, the drums rotate, redirecting the car while converting crash energy into rotational motion. This rolling movement spreads out the force, keeps the car more stable, and reduces the risk of flipping. In the right spot, that difference could mean walking away from a crash instead of being carried out. These systems are already on the road in South Korea and parts of Europe, and now they're showing up in US crash tests, especially for dangerous curves and off-ramps where redirection matters most. But innovation isn't just about moving parts, it's happening in materials too. Engineers are experimenting with rubberized concrete that flexes on impact, and cable systems with better tension control and breakaway posts built to handle heavier vehicles. Because as cars evolve, engineers should always ask themselves one question. How can we make modern road barriers even safer? Barriers have come a long way, from being life-threatening systems to carefully engineered safety systems keeping millions of drivers safe. But sometimes, safety isn't about controlling the crash, it's about preventing it altogether. Take car tires, for example. They are built to handle corners and stay stable at highway speeds, all while touching no more road than the size of your hand. So how do they do that? Click here to find out.